one of our great regrets is, is that we cannot answer all the letters we receive in the course of a week or a year personally. So what we'd like to do today is share with you, and hope you're viewing, some of the letters you've written to us and answer them. With me, as always, are Fathers Jenkins and Kelly. Father Cl Kelly is uh, spiritual director of St. Joseph's Novitiate in Round Top, New York. Father Jenkins is pastor of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and I, of course, am Julius Smetona, your host. Uh, Reverend Fathers, we have a, a large stack of mail that we've tried to uh, select from an even larger one, and hopefully we'll have time to uh, consider most of them. The first one is from a, a, a lady in Erie, Pennsylvania. And she said as follows, uh, It is my fervent and heartfelt prayer that somehow the good Lord can bring you back to the fold, our mother, the Holy Catholic Church, under our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II. I've been trying to get you to take me off your mailing list ever since I got on it. And as soon as I found out that you are not Catholic, that you have broken away from the church, I stopped watching your program. And then the coup de grace is, you don't seriously believe that our Holy Father was marked with the sign of the adorers of Shiva, the Hindu goddess of destruction. Well, we'll answer that question first. We have a picture which is readily available with John Paul II precisely getting marked by the, uh, with the sign of the adorers of a Shiva by a Hindu priestess. And what's even more interesting, this book, this uh, picture came from a book called Peter Lovest Thou Me, written by uh, Abbe Daniel Lourou, and the Vatican was more than happy to supply him with these pictures. So it's not that it's difficult to get this if you'd really like to see it. But for the rest of the letter, I'll, I'll refer, defer to the Reverend Fathers. I'd have to say that I understand how that woman feels. Mm -hmm. I understand uh, that it is a very, very difficult situation and a very, very important question. Because by appearances, in that we refuse to go along with the reform, it seems that we are being disobedient. And the question is, how can you be a Catholic if you're disobedient? How can you be a faithful Catholic if you are in a situation in which you are opposed to virtually everything the hierarchy is doing. So I understand and I sympathize with the sentiments of this woman. Those are sentiments which I, to some extent, experienced when I was in the seminary because I found myself defending the hierarchy against the more radical seminarians and professors until I discovered when I transferred from Catholic University in Washington, D.C. to the seminary on Long Island until I discovered that it is not what people think. It is not a few radical theologians who are the problem, but the problem is the hierarchy. So I was in that situation. I was facing every single day <clears throat> false teachings, heretical doctrines, uh, denials of things which are uh, of divine and Catholic faith. And that is a dilemma. What do you do? These men are teaching these things and are put into this position by the hierarchy. And they are teaching and doing things which is condemned by the hierarchy in the past. So it's a very, very serious problem. But it's a problem and a question that I had to answer in the practical order because either I had to go along with this false teaching or I had to reject it. Of course, I rejected it because I knew that what they were teaching was condemned by this long line of popes. Now, I'm not saying this is the complete or adequate explanation, but in a certain sense, what we're faced with here is we're faced with the hierarchy of the last 30 years teaching and doing things which the hierarchy of the Catholic Church down through the ages and especially over the last couple of hundred years has explicitly, vehemently, and in no uncertain terms condemned. So we have to make a choice between the pastoral changes of the last 30 years and the doctrinal teaching of past popes. And I think as Roman Catholics we are obliged, obliged in conscience to reject these changes of the last 30 years and adhere to 
the teachings, the infallible teachings, especially of popes and councils down through the ages. Father Kelly, you had a letter from a viewer in Dayton, Ohio. Perhaps you'd like to share that with us. Well, this letter is somewhat similar to the letter of that lady. She, this uh, particular viewer gentleman says, I have seen your program, What Catholics Believe, a few times, and I am impressed. Your efforts toward the apostolic mission of the church are most admirable. But I am confused, and I can think of three questions which might help me understand what you are all about. Number one, are you sanctioned by Rome? Number two, are you subject to the Bishop of Cleveland? And number three, if no to one and two, are you disobedient? Hmm. And again, I would simply say, are we sanctioned by Rome? I would say, without any question whatsoever, what we are doing is in perfect and complete accord with what the popes have done and taught down through the ages and most especially Pope St. Pius X. The modernists, however, are up in arms because we will not join their revolution against the traditions of the church and their revolution against Christ. Are we subject to the Bishop of Cleveland? I say this and I don't mean it in any flippant way or any, with any sense of disrespect. I do not consider the Bishop of Cleveland to be a Catholic bishop. I do not consider him to be the Catholic bishop of Cleveland. If he were alive under the pontificate of Pope St. Pius X, he'd be ex excommunicated in two minutes. Are we disobedient? No. And the reason we're not disobedient is because the virtue of obedience, as St. Thomas Aquinas teaches, lies between two extremes. There are two ways to sin against obedience. One way is by disobedience to a legitimate command of a legitimate superior, and the other way is by servile submission to an illegitimate or to a sinful command. And if anyone tells any Catholic anywhere at any time, no matter who that person might be or seem to be, I am under obedience ordering you to embrace Protestantism, in effect, Protestant worship, Protestant morality, Protestant doctrines, to submit to that would be a sin against the virtue of obedience. It would be servile submission to a sinful command. So we are not violating obedience. We are submissive to the authority of the church. We reject any command that would tell us to abandon our Catholic faith and in this, we do, in truth, practice the virtue of obedience. Father Jenkins, you had one letter addressed to yourself. Uh, this is from a viewer in Parma Heights, Ohio. He said, Dear Father Jenkins, I meant to write before, but I thought today I would do that. I watch what Catholics believe in Cleveland on Channel 61 Sunday mornings. I have heard mentioned several times the words, the Antichrist is coming, or soon will be here. In reading St. John chapter 4, verse 3, he is already in the world. I didn't know why it is said that he is coming. Thank you. So the question is, according to this writer, that in the first book of St. John, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, he says the Antichrist is already in the world, and she didn't know that it's said that he's coming. Well. Uh, St. John often refers to the Antichrist um, as, as being kind of a generic figure. He says that anyone who opposes Christ is an Antichrist, you see? Um, so when we read about the Antichrist in the works of St. John, uh, we, we, re, we read about the Antichrist as, as really in a generic sense that anybody who opposes the teaching of Christ uh, merits the title of Antichrist, but St. Paul in his writings is very specific about the, anti the Antichrist not being like diffuse among the population, but that he is going to be an individual, and that this individual is going to come after the church has made great progress. Now this was a prophecy on his part, because when he wrote about this, uh, in his uh, second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, the church was not 
widely spread throughout the world. The church was still very small, consisted of relatively small numbers of people who were struggling against all kinds of obstacles to maintain their faith and spread their faith. And so St. Paul said that the Antichrist would not come until after there was a great apostasy. A great apostasy or a great falling away from the faith presupposes the faith having spread to large numbers of people before there can be such a thing as a great apostasy. So he was actually prophesying or prophesying that the faith was going to spread throughout the world and only then would there come the Antichrist after many of those who had embraced the faith and fell away. Um, and I would recommend that this, uh, this writer uh, pick up the uh, second epistle of St. Paul to the Thessalonians and turn to chapter 2 and read that chapter. It's not very long, but it's very clear that he prophecies that the Antichrist will come in the future only after certain events have first come to pass. I think, if I may add, that uh, it seems that there's a, a distinction made between the spirit of Antichrist and the person of Antichrist. And I believe in his apocalypse, St. John explicitly refers to the person of Antichrist, the man of perdition. He does refer to him as the man of perdition. He says he will set himself up in the temple of God and make himself out to be God. By the way, this, this uh, viewer's letter is a good example of uh, a very common problem. That is, I, I'm sure she is a very good will and she cares very deeply about these things and about our Lord, I'm sure. But there is a certain danger in people picking up the sacred scriptures and interpreting them for themselves. This is, of course, the fundamental principle of Protestantism, that the scriptures contain all truth, but it's up for each individual to decide what they really mean. And certainly, if she might read through the epistles of St. John, she would get one impression, perhaps. Uh, if she picks up that epistle by St. Paul, she would get another impression. But there is no contradiction between the teachings of the two, St. John and St. Paul. It is to the church that Christ has given the authority to interpret uh, uh, responsibly and truthfully his words in the Bible, not to individuals, because if it's up to individuals, they come up with nothing but a collection of riddles. And uh, the human mind, uh, without the direct assistance from God, is not trustworthy to interpret a sublime and sacred text like the sacred scriptures. Mm -hmm. I'd like to remind you what... I would like to add, Julius, to that, <clears throat> this. A lot of people who watch the program see this as perhaps one of many programs in what is generically referred to as religious broadcasting. And I am sure that many of the people have a certain impression about religious broadcasting and about the finances behind it. They see this program on a fairly regular basis and they may have the impression that we have access to financial support like most other religious broadcasting does. And I would just like to say that we operate on what is literally a shoestring budget that from month to month there is a panic just simply to pay bills and there are bills which have gone unpaid for a long time and people are just being very kind and patient. Uh, even such a small thing as paying the telephone bill or being able to pay for uh, transportation, air transportation for example, the priests come here, uh, is for us a very big strain. And we don't want to end up simply on one network or two networks presenting a program and recording at uh, less frequent intervals than we should. We want to get the Catholic faith out to the people. We want to tell the people that all is not lost, that all is not dark, that there are many, many faithful Catholic people out there holding on to the faith. And uh, we, we can't do that. We can't reach uh, these people unless we're able to put the program on at a time that many of those people will see it. Right now it's on basically at 6.30 a.m. on Saturday mornings. And it is a very limited uh, 
number of people. We are tremendously heartened in a certain sense. We marvel at the number of letters we get uh, in view of the fact that it is broadcast at that time. There are many people that have written to us who do not have access to the program now. We want to get the program out. We want to, to increase the quality of the program. We want to communicate the Catholic faith. And this is to the good Catholic people out there who are looking for an anchor to hold on to. And not only for them, there are many, many Protestants of goodwill who are looking for the truth and who would embrace the Catholic faith if they saw that it is what God wants them to do. So we need their help and we need it uh, in, a, in a very almost uh, drastic way for minimal things, for the, for the bare for the bare bones uh, operation that we have. And so I do hope and pray that the people will give and will determine to do it on a regular basis and to do it for the honor and glory of God and especially for sp uh, spreading devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and making available to many this beacon, what we hope is a beacon of hope in a sea of darkness. Mm -hmm. Father, speaking of that, we had a letter from a general, gentleman from Los Angeles, actually Beverly Hills. He wrote the following, I would like to request a list of locations of traditional Latin Mass centers. I should add that I am only 29 years old. I was born in 1962 and therefore have only faint memories of the traditional Mass. I enjoy your informative program and would like a list of stations at times that it runs on. I currently watch What Catholics Believe on Black Entertainment Television Saturday mornings at, get this, 3.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. Pacific Time. I discovered it through an ad you placed in The Wanderer to which I subscribe. May God bless you and guide you. So it's interesting. I could just say from my point of view that we're, we're all amazed at how many people across the country this is teaching, touching, how many people have returned to the traditional mass who wasn't, weren't even aware that it exists, and how many people said, I didn't think anyone agreed with me. I was crazy, and lo and behold, here you've appeared. Father, I see you have another letter there. Yes, this is a letter from a gentleman in Arlington, Virginia, and it's a somewhat complimentary letter. He says... Uh, your television program has helped me to recapture a sense of identity and belonging which I lost as a result of the Vatican II Council, which is really what I try to say, mm -hmm. that there are people out there in the sea of confusion being bounced around like little corks on this great sea who are looking for something to hold on to, to their Catholic faith, which they know is the one true faith given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for many years, I had serious doubts as to whether I was still a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. So many changes had been made in the Church to include the Mass that I wound up in total confusion. It has been difficult trying to remain a devout Catholic while harboring serious misgivings about the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And I would say to him, harbor no misgivings about the Church the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. The soul of the Roman Catholic Church is the Holy Ghost. And the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, can only be destroyed when the Son of God can be destroyed and when the Holy Ghost can be destroyed. And that, of course, is never. St. Augustine said that. He said, when will the Church, the Catholic Church, falter? And he said, when its foundation falters. But how can Jesus Christ falter? So do not identify, I would say, to this gentleman and to all those people out there who perhaps have been led to the brink of giving up their faith because of what they hear the bishop saying. Do not identify the Roman Catholic Church with certain members of the hierarchy who have in fact become enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. The church will last, as our Lord said, until the end of time, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is invincible and indefectible. It cannot change and will remain the institution of salvation given to mankind by our Lord Jesus Christ unto the end of time and his second coming. 
This is a letter from another viewer which again expresses a, a very uh, positive sentiment thanking us for being on the air. She says, I can't begin to tell you how much our family enjoys your TV broadcast. It is the only link for us to the true Catholic Church. She said further that the program yesterday was the first time I have heard about extreme unction since all the drastic changes. She had some more material and concluded, God bless you and our, my prayers are always with you that you may be victorious over all. Sincerely, and the uh, lady wrote from uh, the Hampton, Virginia area. Uh, one question, fathers, which I think maybe could be summarized in one brief letter is we've, we've gotten quite a few uh, uh, questions about uh, John Paul II. And this uh, person is writing from Atlanta, Georgia, and thanked us for a tape she saw of our programs. She said, uh, it assuredly contains traditional Catholic truth. But here's her question, but is not the condition of the conciliar church such that your converts, and we have had converts who converted to the faith as a result of this program, that your converts will have nothing to turn to except entrenched modern in modernism in every diocese of America. Or the present alternative, which they commonly regard as Sadie Vacantism. Uh, she then asks this, uh, how do your priests, these priests, stand with regard to the papacy? And then she concludes, may God bless you for your love of the ancient Catholic faith sincerely. And she says, I would welcome a reply from you. And I imagine the, 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 the key question is, how do your priests stand with regard to the papacy? Okay. I'm going to let Father Jenkins answer that question. Mm -hmm. But before I let him answer that question, I want to answer another question. And it should just take me a second. In a program that we did some time, uh, some time ago, <clears throat> Uh, I made reference to the Garden of Gethsemane and the great significance that the Garden of Gethsemane has. And one of the things that I mentioned was it is believed that the Blessed Virgin Mary was buried there. And in the course of that program, as it moved on, I failed to mention, and it was picked up by our good people, I failed to mention the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven. So what I want to, what I want to make clear is, number one, we don't even know for sure that the Blessed Mother died. There is something called the Dormition of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She may have just fell asleep and was placed in the garden, assuming that, the, in fact, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane. But then she was assumed body and soul into heaven. She followed her divine son in glory. Father Jenkins. With regard to our position on the papacy, we believe that the papacy is of divine institution. What that means is we believe that God himself is the author of the papacy. It is an office that God created on earth for the benefit of the church which he established. Uh, the pope is the, uh, the vicar of Christ. He represents our Lord on earth. He doesn't take his place. He merely represents him. His powers are very great, but they are not the powers of God. He cannot undo what Christ did. His purpose, in fact, the very purpose for which a man is chosen by the church to be the Pope, is to be subservient to Christ, to be the first subject of Christ, and to guard what Christ has taught, to guard, uh, to teach, uh, to rule, to sanctify, to protect these offices of our Lord working through the church. Um, now, the reason why we are traditional Catholics is precisely because we believe this. Uh, we are not traditional Catholics because we've rejected the papacy. Absolute contrary is true. We are traditional Catholics because we believe with our whole hearts in the papacy as the institution of God for the direction of the souls who are, whom God in, in, in will save. Now, we see that there is uh, taking, on, taking place in the, the, the church institutions an attack on that institution of the papacy, uh, that the institution of the papacy is being degraded. It is being degraded not only because you have someone dressed in the white papal garments wearing sombreros and miners' caps and, and Indian headdresses and, and uh, being marked with uh, the sign of the adorers of Shiva and all the rest, but the papacy as an institution is being degraded 
in, in the very idea of the papacy. That the pope, pope is basically a clothes horse. He's like uh, some sort of a, an ambassador of the church to the world, and that's all. And nobody pays any attention to him. And you see the disciplinary uh, practices of the church and, and all of the church's institutions being attacked through the papacy. And no one has so degraded the papacy as, uh, John, let's say, Paul VI and John Paul II in the way they have behaved. The very notion of the papacy in the, in the minds of Catholic people today is very, very low. And it is, to a great extent, perhaps principally, because of the way these men have allowed the papacy as an institution to be dragged down. Now, my point in saying this is that, uh, is that we're trying to maintain the traditional Catholic faith in the minds of the people and trying to glorify the popes who have fulfilled their office and stood up for the true faith and even died for the true faith. Not those who have committed adultery with the world, as Archbishop Lefebvre once said, and tried to glorify the world at the expense of the, of the faith, ex at the expense of Christ. Well, one of the perfect examples of this is, is Hans Kung, who has been teaching that uh, the papacy is not of divine institution. He's acceptable. We are not, because we're traditional. We've run out of time. We thank you for being with us.